Anyway, this is like a really special evening for a whole number of reasons. But the first is because what we're really doing is paying tribute to Sir Ken Robinson. And that's entirely appropriate because the messages that Ken Robinson gave us were all about the focus on the learner and the focus on the child. The messages that he gave us were all about being child-centered and about recognizing progression. What he condemned was the whole concept of this obsession that we have with age and stage. You know, you're five, you must be reading. You're eight, you must be dancing. You're 12, what the hell's wrong with you? That whole concept that we built into so much of the work we do around age and stage, Ken said no, the child and the learner and when they're ready. And the other key thing that he spoke about for me was this idea that so much was based on observation of studying the learner, seeing what they could do and build on that. And lots of you will have heard this anecdote about the woman who was taken along to be assessed and somebody watched her for a while and said, you don't have a problem, you're a dancer. And that approach, I think, sits wonderfully with realizing the ambition and we'll emphasize the links between the two approaches as we go through this evening. But it wouldn't be appropriate to mention Ken Robinson and all his other qualities without saying that the man had the comic timing of Eddie Izzard and he could get his voice heard in places that virtually none of the rest of us can ever reach. He could get in women's hour to talk about education. Normally, to get in women's hour to talk about education, you need to be somewhere to the right of Attila the Hun. But he got there, he made his voice heard, and he asked the right kind of questions. He had the timing of Harry Izzard. He also had the timing of Billy Connolly, although less sweary and with a lot less hair. So that's the man we're paying tribute tonight by imagining if we gave children the education they needed right from the earliest stages. And frankly, there's nobody better to lead us off in that conversation than Richard Gerber. Richard Gerber, we are so fortunate to have international speaker. He's all over the place. I cannot keep up with him. But he had a really close relationship with Ken Robinson. Ken Robinson mentored, uh, mentored him for a long time. He picked him up because of the work that he was doing in his primary school in Derbyshire. He picked him up. He helped Richard become virtually an international celebrity, author, and Ken Robinson is the reason why he and I, Richard and I, know one another. We first met at a conference which couldn't afford to get Ken Robinson because amongst these many qualities, he, he wasn't cheap, and they couldn't afford to get him, so they had a video of Ken Robinson, and then they had Richard speaking about him. I described them as the first medium to channel the living. I wish to God I was saying that tonight because as much as I'm enjoying having Richard and as much as you'll all enjoy having Richard, I really wish above all else, we still had Ken Robinson speaking to us and for us. And on that note, Richard, can I ask you to step in and begin our evening formally with Ken? Brilliant. Thank you so much, David. Um, I can't describe to you the mix of emotions I'm feeling um, right now, if I'm honest. Um, the first thing is I know how much Ken would love the idea of me being the Tesco's value, Ken Robinson. Um, and there were a number of occasions at events that I spoke at and feeling really, you know, filled with ego that I'd been invited to speak at these big events where honestly, talk about emotional unintelligence. Organizers would say things to me like, of course, what we really wanted was Ken, but we couldn't afford him. So for most of my career, really, I've been the Tesco's value, uh, Ken Robinson. Um, and... <laughs> I'm, I, I apologize now, I'm not as funny, I'm not as quick-witted, and I'm way, way more simple. Um, 
But what I thought I'd do just by way of introduction this evening is tell you a little bit about the first couple of conversations Ken and I had together. Um, just to, to lay the groundwork for you, I was a, I was a new head um, in 2001, 2002, taking on a failing school in, in Derbyshire, as, as David said. Um, and we'd started to evolve some really interesting practice. And I met Ken at a conference. It was one of those amazing moments. You know, I, we've got to remember it was before he became Ted Ken. Um, it was before Twitter. It was before social media. So I, I knew of Ken and I knew of his work primarily through all our futures, but I couldn't have pointed him out in the street. Um, anyway, I went along to this conference where I was asked to give a workshop into my school. And they said, I'd set my workshop up uh, heads conference and they said do you want to come in and hear the keynote speaker it's Sir Ken Robinson so I thought brilliant I'll go and stand at the back about five minutes into his speech I wished I hadn't gone in to hear Ken Robinson just before I was about to deliver a workshop for any of you that have ever been in a similar situation when you listen to somebody as brilliant as Ken Robinson knowing you're about to do a workshop afterwards, frankly, you just want to pack up, go home and cry in the car on the way back. Anyway, he was amazing. And like for so many people in that moment, it was an epiphany. Um, his book, The Element, uh, was originally actually going to be called Epiphany. And it was an epiphany moment for me because there he was, this extraordinary man, really talking about all the things I passionately believed in through my career and validating the things that I thought I was a maverick for. Anyway, he finished off. I went and set up my workshop. About eight or nine people came in. And just as I was about to start, you can only imagine... Ken popped his face round the door and said, do you mind if I sit in on this? Well, I was already terrified. You can only imagine what that was like. And I did my workshop um, and everybody left. Or, you know, they said, oh, that was lovely. Thank you very much. And they all left, except for Ken, who sat at the back of the room with his arms folded. And I thought, oh, my God. What have I said? What have I done? Because all I'd been talking about was the things we were, we were cooking up in our school. Anyway. When everyone had left the room, he came up to me um, and he hugged me um, and he said, you know, Richard, that was amazing. Can I buy you dinner? Are you staying in the hotel tonight? And dinner went on till four in the morning. And I remember the conversation as if it was yesterday. Because he said to me, what was your primary vision for what you were doing in your primary school? And we were lucky, we were through primary school. We had a nursery reception through to year six. And I said to him, well, I remember when I was a student, Ken, hearing one of my lecturers say something. And I said, I don't know how you percentage it. And I've never been able to track down the data, but I've always powerfully believed in the sentiment. And I said, she'd said to us in one of our lectures, you know, we learn somewhere between 70 and 75% of everything we learn in our lifetime before we're five. And I said to him, you know, through my entire career, I've thought to myself, can you imagine what humankind could be like if we arrested the graph? You know, that it, phenomenal 70 to 75%, most of us, what do we do in those first five years? We learn to walk and talk. We learn to understand body language, vocal intonation, facial expression. We learn to make sense of the sensory world around us. We are extraordinary learning machines. And if only that graph could somehow be maintained rather than dropping away, what could human potential become? Anyway, we got to our third glass of wine and he said to me in, in the way that Ken did, the incredible raconteur, he said, have you ever heard of John Holt? I said, yes, I, I do remember John Holt, the American progressive educator, the genius of a man. He said, I remember hearing a story about John. He said when he retired, his wife uh, wanted to buy him a gift. And she'd known that all of John's life, he'd wanted to learn to play the cello. So she went and bought him a set of music lessons. Anyway, John, in his retirement, started to learn to play the cello and loved it. 
And a few weeks in, his music teacher said, before we start today, John, I thought we'd just have a chat about where we're going, what we think progress is, where, where you'd like to take your music lessons from here. And she said, uh, you know, she started talking for a bit and, and talking about what a great student he was and some suggestions. And then she turned to John and she said, have you got any questions for me? And he said, well, I, I do actually, but just one. He said, for weeks now, months, I've been telling my friends that I'm learning to play the cello. He said, when am I actually allowed to tell them that I'm playing the cello? And you know, in the brilliant way Ken did to catalyze conversations, we all know exactly what he meant by that statement. Anyway, the second time we met, which was a few months later, he was leaving. He'd only just moved out, actually. He was just moving out to, to L.A. to go and work at the Getty. And he said, I'm flying off to America, back to America tomorrow. But can you email me all about your school, Richard? I've thoroughly enjoyed tonight and I'd love to know more. And I thought, yes, of course I will, thinking I'd never see him again. You know, incredibly charming. Millions of people even then were in his ear and wanting his time. And I sent him stuff and didn't hear anything for a couple of months. And a couple of months later, as was Ken's way, I got a phone call from him saying, look, I'm in London. Have you got some time over next weekend? I've got a day off on Saturday and I'd love to talk to you some more. Would you come and spend the day with me at the hotel I'm staying in? So I did. And that's where we cooked up what I want to share with you. And then I'm just going to shut up and let the conversation commence. Because I really wanted to crystallize what it is we were doing in practice so we could have rigor. And it was one of those things that people mistake about Ken all of the time. He was an absolute, he was committed to excellence. He was committed to rigor. It was really important to him that the validity of the process was at the heart of everything that we do in education. And it really has annoyed me over the years when people pass Ken off as some kind of light liberal who's just talking headlines. And what we did at that second meeting was we created a cycle of learning, which we used at Grange to develop what happened. And I'm just going to talk you through it very briefly now, because I think it's, I hope it's pertinent to our conversation this evening. So if you imagine a cycle, at the heart of that cycle, right in the center were children. I remember us talking for hours about the fact that there were in so many education systems around the world, systems that were predicated on having children nowhere near the top of the list of importance. You know, that you had politicians and government officials and publishers and test, test companies and all of these kind of, they were all ahead. And then there were governors and there were local authority people. And, and all of those considerations somehow came before kids. And because I was leading a failing school, we didn't have to care. And we put kids at the heart of everything we did. And then we created this four stage cycle. Part one was the primary responsibility that we came up with together for the way Grange moved forward was to develop in our children a love of learning and living. Because it was those two things together that meant something really important, that they fed each other, that a love of learning could help kids lead better, more powerful, more exciting, more dynamic lives, and vice versa. And to do that, of course, we needed to create a vision and curriculum that was built around skills, competences, knowledge. The third part of the cycle, though, was a commitment. And at Grange, that became a promise. And the promise was this, that we would never teach our children anything that they didn't think was important. Now, what that doesn't mean is you don't teach the hard to teach stuff. It means you have to make it matter. And that's where early years practice reigns supreme. Because what we wanted to do was pull early years practice right the way through the school so that it was rich in experiential learning and context, so that it mattered to every child, so that you didn't just turn around to a seven-year-old and teach them paragraphing and say, you're just going to have to trust me one day, you'll understand it matters. You really had to sell the concept. And that led to the fourth stage of the cycle, which was really how did we know that we were having an impact? And yeah, there were tests and there was accountability and SATs and all those kind of things that we all live with today. But what we came up with, with was this. 
we are going to generate in our students a sense of tangible aspiration so that we're first of all helping them to dream and then we're building the rungs on the ladder that turn those dreams into an aspiration tangible real skills real knowledge and how they can climb that ladder and second that we were going to give them a real sense of value of place and of purpose because to us that night what was really clear was if we created young people with a powerful sense of aspiration and of a powerful place and commitment and belief in their own sense of value then they would want to learn and live some more and I haven't got time to tell you what happened next, but I'd love to come back one day and bend your ear. I could do it for days. But that was the foundational structure that Ken and I created together that then became the Grange process. And as I finish, I'm just going to finish with this thought. Because I've been thinking for months now about what Ken's legacy is and what it means to me. And there are so many people out there doing so many phenomenal things. But I remember with such affection over the years when I saw Ken's eyes light up the brightest. And Ken's eyes lit up the brightest when he used his reach and his gravitas and his connections to bring people together from different backgrounds. And he used to often do it over dinner somewhere. He'd bring a group, convene a group of people from different backgrounds together who he just thought would get on with one another. And then he'd sit back and watch the magic and the chemistry happen. So for me at the heart of Ken's legacy is a commitment to collaboration, to finding what connects us and for allowing the chemistry to flow. And that's what I hope tonight will bring. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you for letting me open what I hope is going to be an amazing hour. Thank you. Richard, unbelievable. Um, absolutely, you never disappoint me. And tonight you've managed to exceed what were really high expectations. And you, you, you have put yourself, I have to say, Richard, you have put yourself on an absolute pedestal alongside a Nobel Prize winner tonight. <laughs> and the Nobel Prize winner in question is Bob Dylan. May you grow up to be righteous. May you grow up to be true. May you always know the truth and see the light surrounding you. May you always be courageous, stand upright and be strong. And may you stay forever young. May you build a ladder to the stars and climb in every rung. And may you stay forever young. Well done, mate. Um, and I hope that everyone else enjoyed that as much as I did. What you managed to do, Richard, was you managed to absolutely capture the man as a human being and then capture the man as a force for good. And that's absolutely what we wanted from you tonight. If anybody else has fallen a little bit in love with Richard Gerver tonight and would like to tweet about that so that the world can share your joy, we're operating with a hashtag and the hashtag is UpstartF with a capital U and a capital I. So please get your tweets out there. But that for me was a splendid start to the evening and it's gonna be followed up because what we're gonna do now is move to Sue Palmer um, who will be known to almost all of you, I would imagine, as the driving force behind Upstart. Um, and again, like Richard, a well-established author, a former head teacher, somebody who brings an absolute wealth of experience. And what Sue will do is take us from the big agenda of Sir Ken into the specific agenda of realising the ambition in the context of Scotland. And there's a wonderful link to that in an email that Marianne Byrne, one of our panelists sent today, where she said that what she hoped is that this session reinforces the fundamental purposes of raising the ambition, which was and continues to be a resolute focus on the child. What they need from us in terms of high quality provision is to hear and to act upon their voices authentically and with an acknowledgement of their uniqueness. And that for me was just a brilliant link between the two elements that we're trying to bring together tonight. So Sue, who made this event possible with enormous courage, bravery and technical help from Brett Housko, over to you. 
yeah, we're, we're, I'm here to do the sort of realizing the ambition bit. And I wanted to start by saying that, um, you know, the reason is that I'm one of the founders of Upstart, which is a campaign for um, our relationship centered, play based, rights focused kindergarten stage for children between three and seven, the sort of thing they have in Northern Europe, um, particularly Finland, favorite country. Um, and the reason that that organization got started in 2000, and we, we launched in 2016, was that a whole load of us, people from all sorts of backgrounds um, in Scotland, were really, really worried about the changes in children's playing habits, which had been really seriously changing right through from around about the 60s, um, but really went into real steep decline of outdoor play from about the beginning of the 1990s. And that decline just got worse and worse and worse. All sorts of reasons, things like traffic, different you know, um, communities had changed, parents working habits, but also along with it, the steady rise of sedentary screen-based entertainment available indoors, which could keep the kids busy. And that happened getting more and more at the same time as an increasingly competitive educational system. The, 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 the need for the feeling that testing was really important, the need to gather data. And that meant that there was a press down for the measurable subjects of um, literacy and numeracy, right? Um, younger and younger. So basically our kids on the one hand, the, the, you know, they, they were caring about all this cool stuff on the telly. On the other, there was school. And the, the play was squeezed out between cool and school. What they needed to be was outdoors, active and social and playing. But um, oh, as Junior Mitchell says, you don't know what you've got till it's gone, really, do you? It's, um, the scientists have, by the 90s started to get into the science of play and we were learning more and more about how it underpinned practically everything that matters. But all the things that Ken Robinson goes on and on about, you know, creativity, curiosity, resilience, adaptability, all the stuff that will make them be so successful, happy, Chill people for the rest of their lives, well-being. What, what is it that's at the, the United Nations um, Convention on the Rights of the Child defines early childhood as not to eight. And early childhood education, it says, is more than a preparation for primary school. It's about the holistic development of children's physical, emotional, social, and cognitive needs to lay a, a strong and broad foundation for lifelong well-being and learning. I love that. Actually, I've, I must have read it so many times now. I have recite it. That's the first time I try. Um, and essentially, it's in those first not to eight years that all sorts of things that um, happen naturally, develop naturally, and Richard's talked about some of the social skills, problem solving, all the stuff, you know. Um, they're all in our DNA, but of course the child has to be born into the world because it's the being connected with the world and connected with people that triggers the expression of these things that we're, we're naturally adapted to do. And if you think about countries where they've got a kindergarten stage for say four years, um, where that is developing these things that you really, it, that gives every child so much better a chance than one like us where if they're lucky, they get two years in nursery. And then because of the way our curriculum for excellence works, even though they're still in what's known as the early level, they, they have to jump into a, a primary school setting where oh, all sorts of differences. I mean, we've got an early level that really does cover about four years, it could do, but it's split down the middle. And that change, they've been in nursery, they've been, basically with people who really understand child development, play-based pedagogy. Nowadays in Scotland, um, an awful lot of outdoor time and a lot of being in nature, all sorts of things we're looking for. And then um, over into school, suddenly they're indoors all day. Suddenly there's a test at the end of the year in literacy and numeracy. Suddenly, oh, things like, obvious things like the ratios, adult to child in nursery, one to eight. You're suddenly four or five and it's one to 20. Um, 
they lose their access to the outward is a different world. Now, that should not be. That's not what the early level was supposed to be about. But that's what our culture sort of expected it to be because they're in school. Um, so um, that's why I'm getting there, Marion. That's why <laughs> in February 2020, just over a year ago, we were just so thrilled when this document was released called Realising the Ambition. Um, previously, there'd been two documents. There was one for nursery called Building the Ambition, and there was one for primary one, two, it was called Building the Curriculum. You can see there's a sort of, you know, people seeing a different ethos. But this one went from not to the end of early, early level. And oh, I've got lovely pictures of it, you know, and, and show, showing the sorts of headings you get words like development and play and child, that's about the child being the center of the whole thing. Absolutely wonderful. Um, and um, then I thought that's when we, when we were thinking about doing an Imaginist event for the celebration of Ken Robinson's life, I thought, wouldn't it be lovely if he could come and talk about realizing the ambition? Well, of course, that's an imagining that won't happen, but the idea of him meeting realizing the ambition was a beauty, and that's why we wanted to do today. I, um, I've started saying lately, and it's, it's a sad thing, and I shouldn't be so negative, but actually it, is, it does feel it a lot. I started thinking of early years as the Cinderella of the education sector. Uh, you know, the rest of the sector, they, they don't really take much notice. The rest of the education system doesn't take much notice of it. They don't really understand it, I think. I don't think they, because it's a different sort of, learning. It's about supporting children rather than more explicit teaching that goes on later on. Um, and so they don't think about it. But there she is sitting there. She's got the one slipper on her foot. That's the bit that's in primary one. Um, and I just thought if Ken Robinson could have met the Cinderella of the education system, it would have been love at first sight. And she would have been transformed, the magical transformation, but I do this into a feisty Scottish princess that will be able to take the whole of curriculum for excellence onwards and upwards into the broad sunlit uplands of um, lifelong well-being and learning. I really think if we get it right at the beginning, and it's all in that document, if only we can get people to read that document outside the early years at early level um, and even primary. We need the secondary people to need, read it. We need the MSPs to read it. We need the policy makers, all those people that Richard listed because until they've understood what's so important at the beginning, they're not gonna be, not gonna be facilitating of us getting them. Thank you, Sue. Um, thank you very much for that. And, and, and we're backed up. We don't just have two stars. Um, we've, we've got a real cast tonight. So we've got a marvellous panel. We're really fortunate to have them. We've got Marion Burns, who is one of the co-authors of Realising the Ambition, that statement that we've been talking about so much, and also an HMI. I'm absolutely delighted to have Marion with us. We've got Rachel Cowper, who is the Programme Director for Thrive Outdoors, for Inspiring Scotland. And again, I'm particularly delighted. I was on the board of Learning Through Landscapes and have been closely involved in outdoor ed. So just a real treat for me to have Rachel with us. And Heather Armstrong from Starcatchers, the great Scottish National Early Years Creative Organization. And again, just absolutely delighted because we've also got a creative learning plan. Um, and I wrote a bit of that, so I think it's a real shame that nobody's read it either. And what we really need to focus on, I think, is exactly the challenge that Sue's making us. How do we quarry out the time? How do we quarry out the time to make sure that we get hold of all of this? But we're not going to dwell on that. We're going to ask the panel and Richard and Sue if she wants to come in on this to start us off by answering my question which is from your perspective and from your experience, what is it that gives you hope 
that we are about not only to realize the ambition that's stated in that document, but realize the ambition that Ken Robinson had for beyond all our futures. And I'm perfectly happy for any of the panel to kick off on that as long as they can manage to unmute themselves. Over to you. David, I'll kick off if you don't mind. Not at all. With that. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Delighted to be with you uh, and to be here representing Realising the Ambition as one of the co-authors. And I know that my other co-authors are in the audience listening, Liz and Lynn. Delighted that they are here too. But um, what do I have hope for? What do we have hope for um, about Realising the Ambition one year on? I think it's that uh, play as pedagogy um, really manifests itself across the early level, because I think whilst they are not one and the same thing, RTA and CFE, they very much complement each other. And so some of the philosophy that exists within realising the ambition, I think I'd like to see that the, the hope for me is that that continues to be embraced. Uh, just a wee reminder of what that philosophy is, is actually about. And it's been picked up by some of our speakers already. And that is to prioritises the image of the child and acknowledges the key role of family. That it, um, for me, and uh, all that is said within that golden thread of realising the ambition, that it recognises the continuous development of the child from their earliest days. It foregrounds the importance of relationships and well-being. But uh, above all, what it does is it values that holistic nature of, the, of childhood from pre-birth and beyond into primary school. So my hope is that we continue to embrace it. And so far, um, as I read the runes, we have had such an amazing response to realising the ambition. And I would link it very strongly to a creativity agenda. Uh, pass to whoever wants to speak next. David, it's Rachel here. Um, if you can all hear me, I was just thinking in terms of hope, um, and as I represent Thrive Outdoors, you can probably guess where I'm going. But in relation to what has happened over the, the pandemic, and in relation to raising ambition, uh, realising ambition and the documentation that's out there, there is, and I think there's been significant changes and a groundswell of people actually understanding and valuing how the outdoors and how using the outdoors as a medium for play and for learning can actually support the whole development of the whole child through their lifetime. Whether you look at it from the physical aspect or and being and addressing sedentary behaviors by being able to move more outside, being able to develop proprioception, working on uneven surfaces and climbing trees, whether it's resilience and challenge through experimenting and being engaged in things right through to that element of concentration and that time at task if you want to use research uh, language but we've all seen the child who's engrossed with the spider or the ladybird and spending hours just watching what they're doing so in terms of hope i think all the frameworks are there to enable such a change in how we look and how we educate our children and in terms of where we can take it in the future, there is definitely scope to look at where the outdoors can so, so support the education of our children going forward, the lifestyle choices of our children going forward, their health and their well-being going forward. And whether you want to use the government language of build back better or whatever phraseology comes to mind, the use of our outdoor and natural spaces to create that connectedness with a sense of uh, place and space is absolutely key I feel so I think there's definitely hope there's definitely been a bit of a change and the pandemic for all it has been incredibly challenging for so so many of us has given that opportunity where people are considering things differently now can I um pick up on, on just a couple of things actually a couple of um, things I've been involved in lately, which I think both give us hope and challenge. Um, the hope comes in this, and I hope it kind of parallels and, and resonates with what's just been said. I was at an event recently where the National Literacy Trust were giving out some really interesting data. Um, what they do every year is they um, ask, survey thousands of children in the UK 
um, about their reading habits. And one of the questions in particular they asked them is how many young people, and the survey I think is between uh, children between the ages of nine and 18. And they, the survey asks what percentage of those young people enjoy reading for pleasure. Now, prior to the first lockdown, that percentage was just over 47% which it turns out is the lowest percentage in the last decade when kids have been asked the same question. Kind of no surprises there, tragically. But here's the really interesting thing. They redid the survey with the same few thousand children uh, during and towards the end of the first lockdown. And the percentage went up to 55%. And the reasons young people gave were because they weren't being told what to read and they had time and space to read and they were enjoying reading for pleasure and they found it freeing. And actually what the survey went on to find was it had a profound impact on those young people's mental health. Now, I think that's really exciting, but I also think that's a huge challenge because of course that is determined by the number of kids that have access to great reading materials and books. Which brings me on to the second point, which is access, which I hope picks up a little bit on something Rachel said. Um, because the other thing I've been involved in recently is um, some work, some research carried out by the Global Action Plan into what's called the values perception gap. Now the values perception gap looks at the difference. And in this case, the, the research was done again with young people, actually teenagers, into the number of young people that passionately care about things like the environment versus the number of children who think other kids feel the same way they do. And we have a real challenge because when the research was done, the vast majority of young people expressed a passion for the outdoor environment. And again, something that has grown significantly during the last year. But the challenge is most young people questioned didn't believe their peers cared as much as they did. Mm -hmm. So those to me are two really interesting statistics and pieces of research and I think can present a really exciting challenge for the way forward for all of us. Heather, can I just give you the opportunity to come in? Yes, that's brilliant, thank you. Um, just to go back, thinking about realising the ambition and hope, um, just to give people a kind of quick sketch of what I do. So I head up uh, the Creative Skills Programme for Star Catchers, which for six years was about really practical training, looking at the arts, but specifically from a creative, open-ended, playful perspective for early years. So for six years, it was about practical things and relationships and being in the same room. And for the last year, it's been about trying to get that inspiration and that creativity across while sitting in my house. So that's been <laughs> my <laughs> that's been my challenge. Um, I think what gives me hope is the change that I've seen over the last seven years. So when I started this job, I was talking about creativity and play, and it was like throwing truth bombs into the room. Um, whereas now I find when people, when I meet people in early years for the first time, on an intellectual and a practical, they get it. It's already, it's, I think it's established now, actually, yes, creativity is important. Yes, play is important. Yes, the voice of the child and self-expression is important. What we are still finding, and I think Rachel picked up on this in our kind of preamble chat is that just because you think just because you know it's important doesn't mean you always know what it looks like and feels like and I think that's our next challenge I think I think the will is there I think the excitement is there and oh my goodness thank goodness the, the document is there to roll up and whack people over the head if we feel that they're they're not following it properly but I suppose I just want to say to always remember that creativity and play it's still, it's a really personal thing. We're asking people to bring part of their personality to their job. And if they don't feel it, if they don't feel creative, if they don't feel playful when they walk into that building, then we need to make sure that we have uh, both structures, but also really practical opportunities in place to help people build that confidence so that they're ready to do the job that we're asking them to do. Brilliant. I, I once told my senior management team when I was a director, I told them that I, I was going to bring my personality to work and one of them went, David, that's great, don't bring all of it. 
So, <laughs> you know, I think for all of us to learn from. Um, but brilliant stuff coming in on the chat. Lots and lots of supportive comments about outdoor learning. Lots of lovely comments about star catchers. And what we're getting on the chat, I think, is a real echo of the grounds for hope that we're hearing from, from the panel. But there's a real interesting concern coming through um, in the chat about the quality of CLPL, some questions being asked about initial teacher education. There's some interesting stuff about the sustained quality um, of learning and development for, for teachers going through the system. And just wonder if anybody wanted to comment on that at all. Uh, David, yeah, I, I would come in and say that the obviously realising the ambition um, is available in hard copy, but it is also available um, electronically. And within the document, what you will find are, are various links that we um, are continually updating from the point of view of professional learning, because we do see that the you know the document, um, whilst it, you know it's it's um, it's um, when it was created, it was created from the ground up. When we've talked about groundswell, so really when um, you know the hashtag Great We Team, who will know what I'm talking about. Um, where we, we started by speaking to those who were going to be using it the most. And really um, on the back of the 1140 expansion, which really preempted the refresh, we really needed to be thinking about um, the workforce. We needed to be thinking about how to support them. And so therefore um, realizing the ambition has that continuous uh, focus on professional development, professional learning. For all educators, we don't tend to um, say, I mean, that that's the words we use. We use either practitioners, we don't separate people out um, by, by role. It's about being an educator. So there are various modules that people can tap into. I think to pick up on Heather's point about what does it feel like, sound like to be in a setting, clearly COVID has changed all of that. But again, I would pick up on something that Suzanne Zedek said not so long ago um, about maybe COVID has given us an opportunity here to, to kind of reconceptualise what it is we do in terms of our child-centred approaches. Uh, and I really would say that that's really, for me, uh, it's, it's so important that we embrace realising the ambition uh, as being a child-centred way forward. And if we adopt that and that philosophy, then uh, people buy into it right from the, the very beginnings of it. So therefore they want to uh, um, be engaging and whether and I could go on at length and I won't take up too much more time is to see the impact already. So we're not dragging people to, to realising the ambition. They are coming in their thousands to it and embracing the philosophy that's there. And we start with the child. Yeah. Can I say a hope thing? Can I say a hope thing? Just on the back of that, because the thing I wrote down when you said it was yesterday, we got a wee video tweet from a school of a group of P1 children who were playing outside and they were using creativity and curiosity and teamwork and empathy and all sorts of skills to solve a problem and talking it through themselves. So you, you could tell there's a teacher in the background, she was taking the video, but she was leaving them to it. And it was beautiful. In the end, the little girl walked the plank, which was the thing they were trying to sort out. Everybody contributed. This tiny little clip. That has been the most retweeted and most liked thing we have shown on our Upstart website. It's gone hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of retweets. It's gone everywhere. And I think that's the point, that, that when people do it, like those teachers, that teacher was doing it. And when you see it, <laughs> you know, that's that's the thing. That yeah. And, so that, and, I found and, that very helpful. I think there's a really important point that Sue's making there, which again chimes beautifully with the chat, that, you know, yes, we do need this absolute groundswell in terms of provision um, of initial training and relevant training. And we also need that sustained commitment to CLPL. Delighted, Marion, for your optimistic contribution to it. But one of the things that you're highlighting, Sue, is that there is such 
good practice and lots of tributes coming through on the chat about the resilience that children and young people have shown, the resilience that staff have shown, you know, teachers, uh, support staff, all, all kinds of staff have shown an incredible resilience and an incredible commitment. And there's really something to build on there. And I want to do, and sorry, this is might be self-indulgent, but I would want to do a huge shout out to Juliet Robertson, who is one of the finest proponents of curriculum learning and development, not only here in Scotland, but now internationally, two marvellous books, Dirty Teaching and, and Messy Maths, and a joy to hear at any stage. And Judith is undergoing treatment for a very serious form of cancer at the moment. And it's just a great opportunity to ask people to send good wishes and if they're so inclined put their hands together in prayer for, for Judith because she's she's just a wonder Juliet rather just a wonderful 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 example of the finest quality of CP CLPL that anyone can ever experience so you know lot lot to admire and be grateful for so lots of stuff coming in in the chat but I, the question I want to go to now is one that was sent in earlier by Liz Fairwinds which we think might be an alias, but we're not entirely sure. And there are two questions, but I'm going to run them together. And the question is really about how we sustain the kind of messages and ambitions that are absolutely clear in realising the ambition and which are clear also in Ken Robinson's work. How do we sustain that beyond early years? and make sure that it's part of the ongoing education of all of our young people from early years moving forward. And again, happy for anyone to come in. David, I'll come in again if, if you like. Um, quite yeah. happy to do that. Um, I mean, strengthening that thread of quality, um, you know, which you, you've kind of mentioned there, um, I, again, I think it's about pedagogic culture, and, and I lean on that terminology from um, a, a colleague of mine, Lorna Arnott, and it's, the, it's all about the, you know, the culture that we develop within our settings and our schools. And, and it's the role that children play in actually influencing that pedagogic culture. So I, I think the way in which we strengthen that is, is to look for um, a child-centered approach, a pedagogy of play, uh, and a realization that um, we, we need to kind of start from the child. Uh, and that's not that kind of empty mantra that um, Julie Fisher talks about, that we're really looking to have a very child-centered approach. Uh, and I would pass the, the baton to anyone else who wants to pick up on that from there. Anyone else I'd, want to come in? Yeah, I, I'd actually broaden that a little bit and start talking about a family-based approach mm -hmm. because for the hours that uh, the wee ones are with us, there's a whole other life where they're not, you know, where they're not and could be having very different, um, very different experiences in terms of how they experience the arts or how they experience the outdoors, how they experience play. Um, and I do think that if we're talking about like a, a societal shift it has to be yes it has to happen within education but it has to happen out with education as well because as long as we have a general public who doesn't get it you know we're all really lucky you know we're here because we get it you know and as ever we're preaching to the converted there's hundreds of folk out there that just don't get it you know they want their kids to be happy and healthy and they want them to succeed but and and that's it. And they they don't they don't understand they don't understand they don't have the same knowledge they don't have the same kind of in depth experiences. And I think we need to I'm always banging on about this, but we need to do a better job of of getting this message outside into the real world, as it were. And I think part of that is not just speaking in the language that we're used to speaking, but it's about tapping into what other people care about. So. I remember talking to this parent and she was saying, yeah, yeah, creativity is so important um, and I get it and I want her to be able to express herself, but I also want her to have a good work ethic. And I feel like if she doesn't go to school and, you know, learn how to read and write at four and five and follow instructions and how is she going to have that good work ethic? So, you know, when you start with that conversation, it's easy for me to, oh, well, actually what we're talking about when we're talking about creativity and play, we're talking about intrinsic motivation. We're talking about falling in love with learning. We're talking about um, 
you know, we're, we're talking about children who really want to learn and who will work hard because they, you know, they, their curiosity has been sparked and supported. But that conversation is going to be different with different people as their motivations change. So I'm just going to encourage everyone, I guess, to kind of like push your boundaries and, and kind of be a chameleons a little bit and say, well, actually, it's not about what I care about. We all know what we care about, but actually, what do you care about? Well, actually, this is how creativity can play can help, whether it's literacy, numeracy. I love the fact that um, COVID's got us talking about the mental health of wee ones for the first time possibly ever outside of these conversations. So it's about tapping into what the rest of the world cares about and then saying, well, actually, this is why it's important. Brilliant. Jump Anything in, else want to come in? Yeah, if I may jump in just on the back of Please. what you were saying, um, and I sort of flashed the message just to David before about the cultural piece, but it follows on exactly where Heather's saying, you know, world is, the children's lives isn't isolated, it's just what happens just in, in their educational hours of the day. They have a 24 hour lifestyle. And actually, the impact that parents have and wider culture has on how they develop how they become the people of our society in the future is impacted by every hour of those days. So therefore the cultural influence, the acceptance and the promotion of why outdoors from my point of view and outdoor play, play is so crucial is, is a responsibility of, all, or of us all, not just within our working environments. That wider emphasis around dirt is good, that children can learn and play and be creative. You know, Heather will know from, from her work, she'll have seen this many a times, that you give children outside space and some loose parts, materials, they will create all manner of stuff. A stick is not just a stick, it's a million and one other things in a child's mind. So actually enabling that and supporting that from the most formative of years, inspiring that curiosity, developing that joy, means that children want to absorb and understand things that are of interest to them. And as adults, we all know, if we're happy and enjoying doing something, you do more of it. If you can inspire and make children enjoy learning, be curious, be interested, they will continue to do it. The argument sorts itself out as a child goes through their life. If through those formative and those, those years of scaffolding that exist when, I think when Richard said 70, 75% of development takes place, if we enable that to be so holistic and so involving, then the opportunity is there, the hope is there, if we're brave enough. Brilliant, and this is obviously gonna to have to be the last question because we're just being overwhelmed um, by answers. So I just want, we, we, we've heard from everyone on the panel, Richard, anything you want to add at this stage to that question about how do we get this right throughout education and you're an expert on change so I mean I, look, for me there are two things really it's about making and, and really it just wraps up what everyone else is saying it's about making the implicit explicit um, and, and one of the things we've got to do is have a dialogue about what kind of people we want our kids to be um, when they leave education and that dialogue needs to be inclusive so that actually we take some of the things we take for granted so for example that some kids um, develop grit, some develop curiosity and creativity, and some develop resilience and courage. But all too often, those things are implicit in the way our young people develop. They're not explicit. They're not planned for in the same way that we plan for so much other elements of a, of a curriculum, particularly beyond early years practice. So we need to make those things explicit and then we can have a dialogue with parents about how we do that and how we involve parents more explicitly in that, that partnership. And the other thing I just want to say is we also need to remember play is not exclusive to children. We need to actually make people realize that right now, some of the world's most dynamic and successful organizations, businesses and corporate environments around the world use play at the absolute heart of their sustainable creative development and innovation. And I think if we can get those two things right and build those into a national narrative, we've got a far better chance of, of creating a sustained process of both validating play and explicit development of young people in those areas we take for granted. 
Can I just chip in on the end of that about really? the importance of recognizing the experts in play? And it's one of the things I've learned in the last 20 years is that people in early years, people who've worked with young children really know about this stuff. And yet they are not valued within our system. They are the Cinderella, they're, they're ignored. Uh, the, the Scottish government must be getting really fed up with me. Every time a committee is appointed, I go through everybody's background and then I bang off a letter saying there's nobody from early years up there, you know? They're, they're sort of, the, when they're deciding to bring in assessment or when they get an international panel or something, where are the early years experts? So we've really got to raise that status because this is the beginning. If we get it right at the beginning, then everything else is going to be built on, and we've got to value that workforce. Um, so uh, just to finish, we did do a book this at the end of last year called Play is the Way, which tries to put forward some of these points. So if people haven't heard about it, you'll find out on our website. Brilliant. I, I always remember a conversation with an English advisor when, during one of my odd phases in my career, who was banging on about you know, teaching higher and, and he was so elitist around the whole secondary concept and a voice at the back of the room went, they wouldn't do so well at the higher English and all that Shakespeare if somebody hadn't taught them to read day. Could you do that? And there was just that brilliant silence across the room. This has been fantastic. We could clearly have done with a second hour. What you've managed to do, I think, as, as a group of speakers, has been fabulous because you've managed to link backwards and forwards between the chat and your own contributions. What's coming through in the chat is very much, we need to talk to one another, we need to build in families, we need to build on an understanding of child development, we need to be supported with the kind of training and the kind of initial teacher education, and not just for teachers, the initial training for everyone, so that we know and understand children. And the other theme that's come through, which sits beautifully with the themes that have been coming through in your own book group, Sue, for Upstart, about this need for curiosity, this willingness to engage, this ability to create a culture where learning becomes a desire. And thank you so much, Sue, for making this possible. Thanks to Brett. Thanks to all of the speakers. I'm, I'm going to finish uh, the evening with two things. One is something that I often say when I talk about Richard Gerber and I talk about Richard's first book. And Richard talked a lot about his book earlier. But what they did in the school effectively was they started off saying they would build a climate for learning. So they did all the outdoor learning, they did all the play, they did all of those things that we've talked about tonight to engage. And then in the third year, the plan was to focus on raising attainment. Lo and behold, attainment raised in the first year as measured by the standard assessment test. It went up again in the second year. By the time Richard and his colleagues got to the third year, they were already achieving beyond the levels that they would have expected to be reaching when they set their targets. And the message Sometimes the best way to get the right results is to do the right things. The right things are to care about children, meet the learner from where they are and where they come from, build on their experience, their community, respect them, give them the opportunity to show you who they are and you take responsibility for helping them to see who they might be. Thank you so much for being part of this. It's just been a brilliant evening. If you've enjoyed it half as much as I have, you've had a brilliant time. <laughs>